Autumn to my mother by Jean Starr Untenmeyer. Read for LibriVox.org by Laura Armentrout. How memory cuts away the years, and how clean the picture comes of autumn days brisk and busy, charged with keen sunshine. And you stirred with activity the spirit of those energetic days. There was our back yard, so plain and stripped of green, with even the weeds carefully pulled away from the crooked red bricks that made the walk, and the earth on either side so black. Autumn and dead leaves burning in the sharp air, and winter comforts coming in like a pageant. I shall not forget them. Great jars laden with the raw green of pickles, standing in a solemn row across the back of the porch, exhaling the pungent dill. And in the very center of the yard, you, tending the great ketchup kettle of gleaming copper, where fat red tomatoes bobbed up and down like jolly monks in a drunken dance. And there were bland banks of cabbages that came in by the wagon load, soon to be cut into delicate ribbons, only to be crushed by the heavy wooden stompers. Such feathery whiteness, to come to kraut. And after there were grapes that hid their brightness under a gray dusk, then gushed thrilling purple blood over the fire, and enameled crab apples that tricked with their fragrance, but were bitter to taste. And there were spicy plums and ill-shaped quinces, and long string beans floating in pans of clear water, like slim green fishes. And there was fish itself, salted silver herring from the city. And you moved among these mysteries, absorbed and smiling and sure, stirring, tasting, measuring, with the precision of a ritual. I like to think of you in your years of power, you now so shaken and so powerless, high priestess of your home. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Awakening by George William Russell. Read for LibriVox.org by Todd Jenkins. The lights shone down the street in the long blue close of day. A boy's heart beat sweet, sweet, as it flowered in its dreamy clay. Beyond the dazzling throng and above the towers of men, the stars made him long, long to return to their lights again. They lit the wondrous years, and his heart within was gay. But a life of tears, tears, he had won for himself that day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. By the Margin of the Deep by George William Russell Read for LibriVox.org by Todd Jenkin When the breath of twilight blows to flame the misty skies, All its vaporous sapphire, violet glow, and silver gleam, with their magic flood me through the gateway of the eyes, I am one with the twilight's dream. When the trees and skies and fields are one in dusky mood, Every heart of man is wrapped within the mother's breast, Full of peace and sleep and dreams in the vasty quietude, I am one with their hearts at rest. From our immemorial joys of hearth and home and love, Straight along the margin of the unknown tide, all its reach of soundless calm can thrill me far above, word or touch from lips beside. Ay, and deep and deep and deeper let me drink and draw from the olden fountain more than light or peace or dream, such primeval being as or fills the heart with awe, growing one with its silent stream. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Death of Autumn by Edna St. Vincent Millay 
Read for LibriVox.org by Laura Armentrout. When reeds are dead, and straw to thatch the marshes, and feathered pampas grass rides into the wind like aged warriors westward, tragic, thinned of half their tribe, and over the flattened rushes, stripped of its secret, open, stark and bleak, blackens afar the half-forgotten creek, then leans on me the weight of the year, and crushes my heart. I know that beauty must ail and die, and will be born again, but oh, to see beauty stiffened, staring up at the sky! Oh, autumn, autumn, what is the spring to me? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fairies by Rose Fileman Read for LibriVox.org by Pam Castile There are fairies at the bottom of our garden. It's not so very, very far away. You pass the gardener's shed, and you just keep straight ahead. I do so hope they've really come to stay. There's a little wood with moss in it and beetles, and a little stream that quietly runs through. You wouldn't think they'd dare to come merry-making there. Well, they do. There are fairies at the bottom of our garden. They often have a dance on summer nights. The butterflies and bees make a lovely little breeze, and the rabbits stand about and hold the lights. Did you know that they could sit upon the moonbeams and pick a little star to make a fan, and dance away up there in the middle of the air? Well they can. There are fairies at the bottom of our garden. You cannot think how beautiful they are. They all stand up and sing when the fairy queen and king come gently floating down upon their car. The king is very proud and very handsome. The queen, now you can guess who that could be. She's a little girl all day, but at night she steals away. Well, it's me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fifty Years Spent by Maxwell Struthers Burt Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio Fifty years spent before I found me Wind on my mouth and the taste of the rain, Where the great hills circled and swept around me, And the torrents leaped to the mist-drenched plain. Ah, it was long this coming of me, Back to the hills and the sounding sea. Ye who can go when so it tideth To fallow fields when the spring is new, Finding the spirit that there abideth, taking fill of the sun and the dew. Little ye know of the cross of the town, and the small pale folk who go up and down. Fifty years spent before I found me a bank knee-deep with climbing rose, saw or had space to look around me, knew how the apple buds and blows. And all the while that I thought me wise, I walked as one with blinded eyes. Scarcely a lad who passes twenty, But finds him a girl to balm his heart. Only I, who had work so plenty, Bade this loving keep apart. Once I saw a girl in a crowd, But I hushed my heart, when it cried out aloud. City courts in January, city courts in wilted June, often you will catch and carry echoes of some straying tune. Ah, but underneath the feet, echo stifles in a street. Fifty years spent, and what do they bring me? Now I can buy the meadow and hill. Where is the heart of the boy to sing thee? Where is the life for thy living to fill? And thirty years back, 
in a city crowd i passed a girl when my heart cried loud end of poem this recording is in the public domain Harbury by Louise Driscoll read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio All the men of Harbury go down to the sea in ships, the wind upon their faces, the salt upon their lips. The little boys of Harbury, when they are laid to sleep, dream of masts and cabins and the wonders of the deep the women-folk of harbury have eyes like the sea wide with watching wonder deep with mystery i met a woman beyond the bar she said beyond the shallow water where the green lines spread out beyond the sandbar and the white spray my three sons wait for the judgment day i saw an old man who goes to sea no more watch from morn till evening down on the shore the sea's a hard mistress the old man said the sea is always hungry and never full fed the sea had my father and took my son from me sometimes i think i see them walking on the sea i'd like to be in harbury on the judgment day when the word is spoken and the sea is wiped away and all the drowned fisher boys with seaweed in their hair rise and walk to harbury to greet the women there i'd like to be in harbury to see the souls arise son and mother hand in hand lovers with glad eyes i think there would be many who would turn and look with me hoping for another glimpse of the cruel sea they tell me that in paradise the fields are green and still with pleasant flowers everywhere that all may take who will and four great rivers flowing from out the throne of god that no one ever drowns in and souls may cross dry shod i think among those wonders there will be men like me who miss the old salt danger of the singing sea for in my heart like some old shell inland safe and dry any one who harks will still hear the sea cry and a poem this recording is in the public domain if by e e cummings recorded for librivox dot org by michael long if if freckles were lovely and day was night and measles were nice and a lie weren't a lie life would be delight but things couldn't go right for in such a sad plight i wouldn't be i if earth was heaven and now was hence and past was present and false was true there might be some sense, but I'd be in suspense, for on such a pretense you wouldn't be you. If fear was plucky and globes were square, and dirt was cleanly and tears were glee, things would seem fair, yet they'd all despair, for if fear was there, we wouldn't be we. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lark Ascending by George Meredith Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp 
He rises and begins to round. He drops the silver chain of sound of many links without a break and chirrup, whistle, slur, and shake, all intervolved and spreading wide like water dimples down a tide where ripple, ripple over curls and eddy into eddy whirls, a press of hurried notes that run so fleet they scarce are more than one, yet changingly the trills repeat and linger ringing while they fleet sweet to the quick of the ear and dear to her beyond the handmaid ear who sits beside our inner springs too often dry for this he brings which seems the very jet of earth at sight of sky her music's mirth as up he wings the spiral stair a song of light and pierces air with fountain ardor fountain play to reach the shining tops of day and drink in everything discerned an ecstasy to music turned impelled by what his happy bill disperses drinking showering still unthinking save that he may give his voice the outlet there to live renewed in endless notes of glee so thirsty of his voice is he for all to hear and all to know that he is joy awake aglow the tumult of the heart to hear through pureness filtered crystal clear and know the pleasure sprinkled bright by simple singing of delight shrill irreflective unrestrained rapt ringing on the jet sustained without a break without a fall sweet silvery sheer lyrical perennial quavering up the chord like myriad dews of sunny sward that trembling into fullness shine and sparkle dropping argentine such wooing as the ear receives from zephyr caught in chloric leaves of aspens when their chattering net is flushed to white with shivers wet and such the water spirits chime on mountain heights in morning's prime too freshly sweet to seem excess too animate to need a stress but wider over many heads the starry voice ascending spreads awakening as it waxes thin the best in us to him akin and every face to watch him raised puts on the light of children praised. So rich our human pleasure ripes when sweetness on sincereness pipes, though naught be promised from the seas, but only a soft ruffling breeze sweep glittering on a still content, serenity and ravishment. For singing till his heaven fills, tis love of earth that he instills, and ever winging up and up our valley as his golden cup and he the wine which overflows to lift us with him as he goes the woods and brooks the sheep and kine he is the hills the human line the meadows green the fallows brown the dreams of labor in the town he sings the sap the quickened veins the wedding song of sun and rains he is the dance of children thanks of sowers shout of primrose banks and eye of violets while they breathe breathe all these the circling song will wreathe and you shall hear the herb and tree the better heart of men shall see shall feel celestially as long as you crave nothing save the song was ever voice of ours could say our inmost in the sweetest way like yonder voice aloft and link all hearers in the song they drink our wisdom speaks from failing blood our passion is too full in flood we want the key of his wild note of truthful and a tuneful throat the song seraphically free of taint of personality so pure that it salutes the sons the voice of one for millions in whom the millions rejoice for giving their one spirit voice yet men have we whom we revere now names and men still housing here whose lives by many a battle dint defaced and grinding wheels on flint yield substance though they sing not sweet for song our highest heaven to greet whom heavenly singing gives us new and spheres them brilliant in our blue from firmest base to farthest leap because their love of earth is deep and they are warriors in accord with life to serve and pass reward so touching purest and so heard in the brain's reflex of yon bird wherefore their soul in me or mine through self-forgetfulness divine in them that song aloft maintains to fill the sky and thrill the plains with showerings drawn from human stores 
as he to silence nearer soars extends the world at wings and dome more spacious making more our home till lost on his aerial rings in light and then the fancy sings end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Law of the Jungle by Rudyard Kipling Read for LibriVox.org by Pam Castile Now this is the law of the jungle, as old and as true as the sky, and the wolf that shall keep it may prosper, but the wolf that shall break it must die. As the creeper that girdles the tree trunk, the law runneth forward and back, for the strength of the pack is the wolf and the strength of the wolf is the pack wash daily from nose tip to tail tip drink deeply but never too deep and remember the night is for hunting and forget not the day is for sleep the jackal may follow the tiger but cub when thy whiskers are grown remember the wolf is a hunter go forth and get food of thine own keep peace with the lords of the jungle the tiger the panther the bear and trouble not hathi the silent and mock not the boar in his lair when pack meets with pack in the jungle and neither will go from the trail lie down till the leaders have spoken it may be fair words shall prevail when ye fight with the wolf of the pack ye must fight him alone and afar lest others take part in the quarrel and the pack be diminished by war the lair of the wolf is his refuge and where he has made him his home not even the head wolf may enter not even the council may come the lair of the wolf is his refuge but where he has digged it too plain the council shall send him a message, and so he shall change it again. If ye kill before midnight, be silent, and wake not the woods with your bay, lest ye frighten the deer from the crops, and the brothers go empty away. Ye may kill for yourselves and your mates and your cubs as they need, and ye can, but kill not for pleasure of killing, and seven times never kill man. If ye plunder his kill from a weaker, devour not all in thy pride. Pack right is the right of the meanest, so leave him the head and the hide. The kill of the pack is the meat of the pack, ye must eat where it lies, and no one may carry away of that meat to his lair or he dies. The kill of the wolf is the meat of the wolf. He may do what he will. But till he has given permission, the pack may not eat of that kill. Cub right is the right of the yearling. From all of his pack he may claim. Full gorge when the killer has eaten, and none may refuse him the same. Lair right is the right of the mother. From all of her years she may claim one haunch of each kill for her litter, and none may deny her the same. Cave right is the right of the father, to hunt by himself for his own. He is freed of all calls to the pack. He is judged by the council alone. Because of his age and his cunning, because of his gripe and his paw, in all that the law leveth open, the word of the head wolf is law. Now these are the laws of the jungle, and many and mighty are they. But the head and the hoof of the law and the haunch and the hump is obey. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Men Improve with the Years by W. B. Yeats Read for LibriVox.org by Winston 
Tharp. I am worn out with dreams, a weather-worn marble triton among the streams, and all day long I look upon this lady's beauty as though I had found in book a pictured beauty, pleased to have filled the eyes or the discerning ears, delighted to be but wise, for men improve with the years. And yet, and yet is this my dream or the truth? Oh, would that we had met when I had my burning youth! But I grow old among dreams, a weather-worn marble triton among the streams. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mr. Apollinax by T. S. Eliot Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp when Mr. Apollinax visited the United States, his laughter tinkled among the teacups. I thought of Virgilian, that shy figure among the birch trees, and of Priapus in the shrubbery, gaping at the lady in the swing. In the palace of Mrs. Flaccus, at Professor Channing Cheetah's, he laughed like an irresponsible fetus. His laughter was submarine and profound like the old man of the seas hidden under coral islands where worried bodies of drowned men drift down in the green silence dropping from fingers of surf i look for the head of mr apollinax rolling under a chair or grinning over a screen with seaweed in its hair i heard the beat of centaur's hoofs over the hard turf as his dry and passionate talk devoured the afternoon he is a charming man, but after all, what did he mean? His pointed ears, he must be unbalanced. There was something he said that I might have challenged. Of Dowager Mrs. Flaccus and Professor and Mrs. Cheetah, I remember a slice of lemon and a bitten macaroon. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Musical Instrument by Elizabeth Barrett Browning Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Long A Musical Instrument What was he doing, the great god Pan, Down in the reeds by the river? Spreading ruin and scattering ban, Splashing and paddling with hoofs of a goat, And breaking the golden lilies afloat With the dragonfly on the river? He tore out a reed, the great god Pan, from the deep cool bed of the river. The limpid water turbidly ran, and the broken lilies a-dying lay, and the dragonfly had fled away, ere he brought it out of the river. High on the shore sat the great god Pan, while turbidly flowed the river, and hacked and hewed as a great god can with his hard bleak steel at the patient reed, till there was not a sign of the leaf indeed to prove it fresh from the river. He cut it short, did the great god Pan, how tall it stood in the river, then drew the pith, like the heart of a man, steadily from the outside ring, and notched the poor dry empty thing in holes as he sat by the river. This is the way, laughed the great god Pan, laughed while he sat by the river, the only way since the gods began to make sweet music they could succeed. Then, dropping his mouth to a hole in the reed, he blew in power by the river. Sweet, 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 O Pan, piercing sweet by the river, blinding sweet, O great god Pan. The sun on the hill forgot to die, and the lilies revived, and the dragonfly came back to dream on the river. Yet half a beast is the great god Pan, to laugh as he sits by the river, making a poet out of a man. The true gods sigh for the cost and pain, for the reed which grows nevermore again, as a reed with the reeds in the river. End of poem 
This recording is in the public domain. The Path That Leads to Nowhere by Corinne Roosevelt Robinson Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio There's a path that leads to nowhere in a meadow that I know where an inland island rises and the stream is still and slow there it wanders under willows and beneath the silver green of the birch's silent shadows where the early violets lean other pathways lead to somewhere but the one i love so well had no end and no beginning just the beauty of the dell just the windflowers and the lilies yellow striped as adder's tongue seem to satisfy my pathway as it winds their sweets among there i go to meet the springtime when the meadow is aglow marigolds amid the marshes and the stream is still and slow there i find my fair oasis and with carefree feet i tread for the pathway leads to nowhere and the blue is overhead all the ways that lead to somewhere echo with the hurrying feet of the struggling and the striving but the way i find so sweet bids me dream and bids me linger joy and beauty are its goal on the path that leads to nowhere i have sometimes found my soul End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Quatrains from Omar Khayyam, done into English verse by Edwin Kendall Cutter. Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug, Perth, Western Australia. Perhaps, my critic says, it is as though the symphony finished. He sits, alone, playing his flageolet. Nay, for t'other day, through Rome, passing me lord's kitchen, a wench sang a simple love song, all in some five notes, for her voice's lute had no more, and methought she eased the day for me, far above the gilded opera. I have small loot enough, God knows, and cracked and borrowed into the bargain. But, faith, tis new to some and strange, and they be passing, heart-sick, and may hear. Quatrains from Omar Out of this charnel house of night and day, Who is it holds the secret of the way? And am I with the ever-changing sea Alike impotent under his dull sway? This world no longer stays than you or me. Think only on its maker, For t'was he set loose thy soul, This maze of life to spell. He knows what went before, And what will be. And if he does not know, what will we gain if we go searching to add pain to pain? He has lived longer, sure, than me or you. Set on your puny task, for his is vain. Of all the throng that broke the clay apart, who hath fulfilled the longing of his heart, who is not weary ere his sleep begins? Oh, that we never had to make the start! All that we know of good dwells up on high, behind the violet curtain of the sky. And if we tore the curtain once and saw, would the grim executioner bid us die? In olden times the gods were seen of men, a handful dared to lift the curtain then. Frantic they came, no more to know themselves. Their eyes had seen, but madness choked their ken. If mortals out of loam and rot he made, Where should the burden of our sin be laid? Surely he did not hope with such poor stuff The roles of priest and angel could be played. O oh, maiden's voices I have loved so long, O oh, flower of Yusuf that wert all my song, I pray, perchance you, coupled with the vine, May plead my pardon to the saints I wrong. Come, come, my love, 
For why should we repine while there is aught so precious left as wine? Life is no desert if I hear your song, and poetry shine out from those eyes of thine. Deep have I drunk with every vagrant maid, Chose wine the other mistress of my shade. Some day my lips for ever must go dry. Ah, curse the day my cup aside be laid. If Ramazan were here, and my disgrace, The seeming wise would not fling in my face. I think I could be happy for a while, And live on crusts and ashes for a space. Come with me while the lotus is in bloom, and cease to think that you need fill a tomb. My lips, O king, and body do but taste, and I will rob the future of its gloom. I shall want sleep, deep sleep, upon my head, and eons upon eons to be dead. So, when I wake, I shall not yawning say, Why could you not have let me sleep instead? For surely paradise must needs be nice, If it a man from out his dreams entice. Give me my sleep and kisses before bed, And red wine too, and they must call me twice. O Kadi son, what were the best to do? And Kadi answered, Sleep a white night through. O unjust ruler of a thousand men, For ere the day come, all is come for you. For if you cheat oblivion of its dread, you need not even know that you are dead, and rule all way, although your rule is done. Being a king of dreams, your kingdom fled. For who, below, can deem a godhead just that steals a boon from my ignoble dust? So when the maidens call me, soft, Kayam, I lie a fathom out of sight to rust. Oft in the winter I forswore the rose, For wine is better when the north wind blows. But now that roses and the spring appear, Perchance my wine tastes better for it. Who knows? And if you chance to find upon some breast A rose of life far brighter than the rest, Snatch quick the rose and tear its petals down, Methinks in this world you at least are blessed. Only a breath divides the day and night. Only a hope spans what be wrong or right. Kayam and God, two different things, you say. Make God of clay and give Kayam the might. Oh, sad to think that when his day does close, man hath not half the grandeur of the rose which dies with twilight or the pale moon's kiss, nor hopes for life the gardener never sows. When all this shadow pantomime is done, and man were better with his race unrun, how will he greet the author of the piece who made him play such tragedy for fun? Tamam should. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 43 by Elizabeth Barrett Browning Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Long How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height My soul can reach when feeling out of sight For the ends of being and ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need By sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs, and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seemed to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And, if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Statue by Ella Wheeler Wilcox Read for LibriVox.org by Heidi Pack 
a granite rock in the mountainside, gazed on the world and was satisfied. It watched the centuries come and go. It welcomed the sunlight, yet loved the snow. It grieved when the forest was forced to fall, yet joyed when steeples rose white and tall in the valley below it, and thrilled to hear the voice of the great town roaring near. When the mountain stream from its idle play was caught by the mill-wheel and borne away and trained to labor, the gray rock mused. Tree and verdure and stream are used by man the master, but I remain friend of the mountain and star and plain, unchanged forever by God's decree, while passing centuries bow to me. Then all unwarned with a mighty shock, out of the mountain was wrenched the rock, bruised and battered and broken in heart. It was carried away to the common mart. Wrenched and ruined in peace and pride, Oh, God is cruel, the granite cried, Comrade of mountain, of star the friend, By all deserted, how sad my end! A dreaming sculptor in passing by Gazed on the granite with thoughtful eye, then stirred with a purpose supremely grand, he bade his dream in the rock expand. And lo, from the broken and shapeless mass that grieved and doubted, it came to pass that a glorious statue of priceless worth and infinite beauty adorned the earth. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. There is a garden in her face by Thomas Campion. Read for LibriVox.org by Eric Holshaith. The Vital Quarter. Dot com. There is a garden in her face where roses and white lilies grow. A heavenly paradise is that place, wherein all pleasant fruits doth flow. There cherries grow which none may buy, till cherry ripe themselves do cry. Those cherries fairly do enclose, of orient pearl a double row, which when her lovely laughter shows, they look like rosebuds filled with snow. Yet them nor peer nor prince can buy, till cherry ripe themselves do cry. Her eyes like angels watch them still, her brows like bending bows do stand, threatening with piercing frowns to kill all that attempt with ire hand, those sacred cherries to come nigh, till cherry ripe themselves do cry. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Untitled Poem, compiled by Marion Dix Mosher, from More Toasts, Jokes, Stories, and Quotations. Read for LibriVox.org by Eric Holsather. TheVitalQuarter.com There was a man who fancied that, by driving good and fast, he'd get his car across the track before the train came past. He'd miss the engine by an inch and make the train hand soar. There was a man who fancied this. There isn't any more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Wants of Man Man Wants But Little Here Below by John Quincy Adams Read for LibriVox.org by Pam Castile nor wants that little long tis not with me exactly so but tis so in the song my wants are many and if told would muster many a score and were each wish a mint of gold i still should long for more 
What first I want is daily bread, and canvas backs, and wine, and all the realms of nature spread before me when I dine. Four courses scarcely can provide my appetite to quell, with four choice cooks from France beside to dress my dinner well. What next I want at princely cost is elegant attire, black sable furs for winter's frost and silks for summer's fire, and cashmere shawls and Brussels lace my bosom's front to deck, and diamond rings my hands to grace and rubies for my neck. I want, who does not want, a wife affectionate and fair, to solace all the woes of life and all its joys to share of temper sweet of yielding will of firm yet placid mind with all my faults to love me still with sentiment refined and as time's car incessant runs and fortune fills my store i want of daughters and of sons from eight to half a score I want, alas, can mortal dare such bliss on earth to crave, that all the girls be chaste and fair, the boys all wise and brave. I want a warm and faithful friend to cheer the adverse hour, who ne'er to flatter will descend, nor bend the knee to power. A friend to chide me when I'm wrong, my inmost soul to see, and that my friendship prove as strong for him as his for me. I want the seals of power and place, the ensigns of command, charged by the people's unbought grace to rule my native land. Nor crown nor scepter would I ask, but from my country's will, by day, by night, to ply the task, her cup of bliss to fill. I want the voice of honest praise to follow me behind, and to be thought in future days the friend of humankind, that after ages, as they rise, exulting may proclaim, in choral union to the skies, their blessings on my name. These are the wants of mortal man, I cannot want them long, for life itself is but a span, and earthly bliss a song. My last great want, absorbing all, is when beneath the sod, and summoned to my final call, the mercy of my God. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.